Imagine, it's the mid-80s and you're graduating from college. It's a sunny day, the first in a while. The rolling lawns of your university seem greener than normal. Maybe it's because your parents are here and you're seeing everything through their eyes. They're so proud of you. The girls are all in form-fitting black cocktail dresses. The guys in dark suits and skinny ties with trendy asymmetrical haircuts. A classmate asks you to take a photo of him and some friends before the ceremony. Get together, you guys. How do we look? <laughs> like a poor man's Duran Duran. You can make jokes because you're not nervous. It's almost as if this whole day is happening to someone else. You should be on the top of the world. After years of committed study, a 3,000 word dissertation in French, a semester abroad in Paris, and lots of tests that you aced without having to study too much, you're graduating. But something just feels off, underwhelming, false. Like, your heart's not in it. Thomas Johnson. Amanda Jones. Colin Jones. When you hear your name, you rise from your seat and cross the stage. As you take your diploma from the dean's outstretched hand, you spot your parents in the crowd, beaming from ear to ear, applauding so wildly it looks like their hands might fall off. You've never seen them happier, at least not in the years since your mom got sick. It's surreal to see your mother in a wheelchair. She was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis when you were 15. That's when your entire world turned upside down. The ceremony ends. You go to your parents, they hug you, congratulate you. You ask one of the Duran Duran lookalikes from earlier to snap a family photo. You make sure to get a shot with each parent holding the diploma. Which is fitting because this is a moment they've been looking forward to all their lives. Your college graduation is their dream come true. But that's not yours. You have a dream that's yours, but it's buried deep inside. So deep that you've barely acknowledged it to yourself, let alone said it out loud. It will take you many years of failure, abuse, poverty, and loss before you start to realize who you were meant to be. From Wondery, I'm Virginia Madsen, and this is Imagined Life. Have you ever wondered what it would feel like to walk in the shoes of someone famous? On each episode of Imagined Life, we'll take you on an immersive journey into the life of someone you may think you know, maybe even admire, or the opposite. But no one realizes what it felt like to be them before the whole world knew their name. You'll experience the challenges, the heartbreaks, the loss, and the triumph. There will be clues to your identity along the way. Only at the end will you find out who you are. So sit back, let go, and imagine your life. On this episode, The Daydreamer. Imagine, it's 20 years after your college graduation and you find yourself at another commencement ceremony. This one's your worst nightmare come to life. The only way it could be worse is if you were covered in spiders. You hate spiders. This should be a happy day, but you're not happy. You're sick to your stomach, heart racing, throat tight, palm sweaty and oh god people are gonna want to shake your hand your clammy sweaty hand you could wipe your hands on your sweater but then you'd have sweat marks on your sweater and that's what people would remember about you and this day the sweaty sweater oh, you should have just said no why didn't you just say no we're so happy you're here 
Thank you, so am I. That's a lie. You would rather be anywhere else. But hey, let's try to stay in gratitude, as they say. They've asked you to give the commencement speech at Harvard. While you've walked down some hallowed halls in your day, these are surely the hallowedest. Is that even a word? You've got to stop making up words. Do you want them to take back that honorary degree they just gave you? This is the green room with some drinks and pastries. Water's over there. Relax and I'll come and get you when they're ready. Relax. <laughs> right. Thank you. Did I mention this is one of the biggest crowds we've ever had for one of these? Not to make you nervous or anything. <laughs> Too late. You're gonna do great. Thank you. You force yourself to take a deep, cleansing breath. Why did they say cleansing breath anyway? What exactly are we cleansing? You step up to the full-length mirror and reassess your outfit for the 20th time that day. Too simple, too casual, too late now. You look down at your shaking hands. Maybe if I just stare at them long enough and hard enough, they'll stop trembling. It doesn't work. You try to remember a time in your life when you felt more terrified than you feel at this moment. You can't think of one. Come in. They're ready for you. As you walk to your doom, also known as the dais, in front of thousands of young people who, let's face it, are probably smarter than you, you can't help but think. How the hell did I end up here? Back to that other graduation, the degree you actually earned. In modern languages, you wanted to major in English and the classics, but your parents thought it wasn't practical. Well, how's some story that's 10,000 years old gonna help you get a job today? Your father asked. His question is rhetorical. It doesn't. They believed that if you could speak another language, you could always find work as a translator. So now, you're officially an adult. Theoretically, you can do whatever you want with your life. But you're still drawn to the quote-unquote safe route your parents laid out for you. You take a series of secretarial jobs in dull, drab offices. They utilize your language and typing skills, and let's face it, you're a kick-ass typist. But the jobs are all mundane and uninspiring, except for one. Amnesty International is a human rights organization with offices all over the world. They help people like political prisoners, refugees, and torture victims who live under oppressive regimes. I'll laugh a minute, it is not. You suck at the organizational parts of the job. A nightmare of a secretary is how you'll later describe yourself. But at least in this dull, drab office, the work has meaning. In some small way, you're helping to make the world a better place. One day, an African torture victim comes in to be interviewed on camera about the unspeakable brutality he's endured. It's harrowing to listen to. Afterwards, your boss asks you to walk the gentleman back to the subway. He's a foot taller than you, and yet he seems so vulnerable, almost childlike. You've just watched him tremble through his interview, recalling one unspeakable horror after another, and you have no idea what to talk to him about. Small talk seems insufficient, but saying nothing seems unkind. You opt for small talk. Is this your first time in the city? Yes. What do you think of it? It is crazy. While looking at you, the man nearly steps in front of an oncoming bus. You throw your arm out in front of him like a mother behind the wheel of a car who hits the brakes with her kid in the passenger seat. He sighs with relief. It is also... Very beautiful. <laughs> Crazy and beautiful. Yes, I agree. You arrive at the subway station and the man sets down his bag, takes your hand in both of his, and looks into your eyes. 
I wish you much future happiness. The fact that this man, who has seen such cruelty and terror in his life, wants good things for you, it just, it causes you to burst into tears. But not in front of him. You wait until his subway car zooms away. Then, you fall apart. A few years later, you meet another young man on another train. The train's late and you're frustrated. You finished reading the book you brought with you, so you're just staring out the window, watching the world go by. And suddenly, he shows up. You hit it off right away. He's younger than you, still in school, bookish like you, and a bit soft-spoken, but he's special. Undeniably so, and he doesn't know it. That's why you find him so irresistible. In the subsequent months and years, you and Train Guy spend a lot of time together. Even when you're in a different city, he's never far from your thoughts. It's not a romantic relationship, really. You're still involved with your boyfriend from college, but it definitely is a love affair. Train Guy, let's call him TG. He sees you the way you want to be seen, as an artist with something to say, something that the world might find interesting and meaningful. But you tell no one about TG. TG is your little secret, and one day, he's going to change your life. It's 7.30 in the morning on December 31st. Hello? It's your father. He never calls this early. You steal yourself. This can't be good news. Your mother's gone. Suddenly, you can't breathe. You knew this day was going to come eventually. You remember your mother drawing up her will at the kitchen table when she was in her late thirties. So why does this news seem so unthinkable? Your head fills with a white noise kind of panic. It's a new feeling, like you're out of control, lost. And it's terrifying. How could this be? You'd just seen her a few days ago, and yes, she seemed weak, but that was always the case. You'd gotten used to her illness getting worse, but you never believed she would actually die. You need to talk to someone who will understand, who's feeling the same way. You call your sister Di, Hi. I can't believe she's gone. At 45? That is so young. I know. A few days later, you're sitting with your sister in a crematorium 30 miles from your childhood home. Your mother's memorial service is set to start in a few minutes. Di puts her arm around you and you finally let go. Why are you so much stronger than me? I'm the older one. Because I'm just a much better person overall. You laugh for the first time since you got the phone call from your father. It feels good. One thing about having your world fall apart, it forces you to look at life with fresh eyes and make some changes. College boyfriend? The sizzle has fizzled. End it. Current desk job? The one you took after Amnesty International? Soul crushing. Get out. To describe you as lost during this period doesn't quite cut it. Loss implies there's something to find, and you have no idea who you are. You're drowning, barely treading water, feeling like you might go under at any second, and you're not so sure you'd mind. It would be so much easier. It's time for a change. A big one. You see an ad in the newspaper. English teachers wanted. Travel to Portugal. Now that 
would really be a change. You apply and you get the job. Woohoo! Sunshine, freedom, Portuguese guys, let's do this! In the city of Porto, you finally feel liberated from your family pressures. It's sunny and sexy and nobody knows you. You finally get to reinvent yourself. You're free to be who you really are, whoever that is. You can figure that out later. Right now, it's party time. You share an apartment with two other teachers from overseas and quickly become best friends. You're all in your mid-twenties, single, ready to mingle. It's on. One Saturday night at a club by the river, you catch the eye of a handsome journalism student named Georgie. Goatee, nerdy glasses, fit, like he's played a lot of soccer under the sun. All good things. He's three years younger than you, but he's also a lot taller, so you figure it cancels out. And even better, he seems to be interested in you. What do you do when you're not teaching? Do you like sports? Of course he asks if you like sports. It's not your strong suit. Oh well, better he knows the truth now. <laughs> I'm the worst. My roommates play soccer, but I just sit on the side and cheer. Or read a book. What are you reading now? I'm actually rereading a book I've read many times before. Sense and Sensibility by Jane Austen. I know this book. I love this book. No, you don't. So which sister are you? Marianne or Eleanor? Uh-oh, you are so screwed. You fall madly in love with Georgie. Mad being the operative word. It's a tumultuous relationship from the get-go, like one of those larger-than-life romances you've read, full of passion, desire, obsession, but also loud fights, usually about one or the other's comings and goings. And then there were the public breakups, followed by equally public makeups and declarations of love. Your relationship was a spectator sport in the neighborhood. One friend who witnessed one of these arguments later told you, it was the look on his face that scared me the most. Not just angry, but afraid and capable of anything. You know what she means. But at least you're finally living. You marry Georgie in a small ceremony at a local government office. Your sister Di flies over as support. You put up your hair and wear a strand of pearls to try and class up the occasion. Later in the afternoon, you teach your regular classes at the language school. There's no honeymoon. For his birthday, you give Georgie a CD of a violin concerto by Tchaikovsky. It's a gift for him, but it's you who puts it on every day. The lead violin feels like a character. One goes through all the highs and lows of life and comes out the other side. Listening to it makes you feel you're part of a longer, larger human story. Georgie, come here, I have something to tell you. You've just returned to your modest apartment after an evening of teaching. You turn the music down, but not off. Something about it that you find soothing. And you need that now. I'm pregnant again. Again, because you'd been pregnant a year ago and miscarried. Not long after you and Georgie met. The loss at the time added more pain and stress to an already fraught relationship. So you don't know if this second pregnancy is a blessed do-over or far more responsibility than your young marriage can withstand. You worry that he's going to get angry. There's nothing worse than when Georgie gets angry. So say something. What do you think? I'm so happy. The moment you'll later describe as the best moment of your life happens on a sweltering hot day in July. You give birth to a daughter. You name her Jessica. After the human rights activist Jessica Mitford you came to admire during your days at Amnesty International. You hope your Jessica turns out to be as brave and strong and compassionate as the woman whose name she now bears. 
But right now, you're the one who has to be brave. Your relationship with Georgie has been tumultuous and jealousy fueled from the word go. There's been physical abuse. Once he even shoved you in front of your co-workers. And now you've reached your breaking point. One cold November night, it comes to a head and you finally say the words out loud. I don't love you anymore. What happens after that is a blur. Crying, yes. Fighting, yes. Yelling, undoubtedly. Being pulled out of the house and onto the street, yes. And worse. When the smoke clears and your senses return to you, you realize that if you're going to survive, have to take four-month-old Jessica and leave Georgie. You have to leave Portugal. You have to go somewhere else. You have no idea where, but you have to do it soon. So you do. It's early in the morning, too early. You stumble into the bathroom, rubbing the sleep out of your eyes and pick up your toothbrush. You sigh. The bristles are a little frayed and they have been for longer than you care to admit. You know you should buy a new one, but you just keep forgetting. I get it, life gets in the way. But with Quip, the new electronic toothbrush, you can put those days behind you. Because with a Quip subscription plan, you'll receive a new brush head every three months for just $5. It comes in the mail, you switch it out. It's that simple. I've got one on the way to me, and I'm so thrilled to be able to put a necessary but annoying aspect of my personal care on autopilot. Quip is backed by over 20,000 dental professionals. Quip starts at just $25, and if you go to getquip.com slash imagined right now, you'll get your first refill pack for free with a Quip electric toothbrush. That's your first refill pack free at getquip.com slash imagined. When you were a little girl, you used to play a game with dye. You call it cliffhanger. One of you dangles off the top step of the family stairwell as if hanging onto a cliff for dear life. And the other sister would be the rescuer who pulls the other to safety most of the time. Sometimes you'd let the other plummet. That was part of the fun. When it comes to your fantasy life, you've always had a dark streak. And Di loved it. No matter what kind of wild story you'd make up or scenario you'd create to act out together, Di was on board. And the fact that the family lived close to both a rolling river and a huge forest made your adventures together even more thrilling and cinematic. Nearly 20 years later, Di is still the one who comes to your rescue. She invites you to come to the city where she recently settled with her new husband, Starting fresh in a new town, a place with no bad memories, sounds like it could be good. But let's face it, you've got nowhere else to go. Going to live with your father is not an option. He remarried two years after your mother died to the woman who had been his secretary, and things between you have been tense. So it's your sister die or die die. Determined not to be a burden, you find an apartment in the city for you and Jessica. It's a total dump, but it's home. No, it's not. It's a total dump. Mice, bugs, hit and miss heating. But the humiliations are just beginning. You apply for government assistance. University graduate, young professional, and now you're going on welfare. It's form after form, interview after interview, all revolving around one thing. How you managed to make such an unmitigated disaster of your life. It says here you were working in Portugal. What were you doing? I was teaching English. Why can't you teach here? I can, but I lack the proper certificate, which I plan to get as soon as I get on my feet a little bit. It's quite an involved process. It takes like a year. The interviewer looks down at you over his glasses, and makes a few notes. He thinks you're a total loser. You're certain of it. A 
drag on society. It doesn't help matters that just a few months ago, a national politician gave an interview where he basically laid the blame for all the ills of society on single mothers like you. I see, he says. But what you hear is, hope you're pleased with yourself, young lady. You've ruined the country. <laughs> you know what would be fun? To hit the pompous know-it-all in the face with a shovel. What about your husband? He's in Portugal. We're divorcing. Are you sure there's no saving it? I'm not sure this is the right place to discuss that, but yes, I'm sure. I'm positive. Mr. Interviewer takes a few notes, then reads over your forms in silence, occasionally offering a disapproving grunt or sigh. As you fixate on the stamp on his desk, the one you need to get your money, you imagine yourself looking down on the sad scene from above. You can't believe you found yourself here, in spite of always doing what was expected of you. Everything your parents feared for you all your life, that you'd end up penniless and destitute with no job, no prospects, and no husband. It's all come to pass. Okay, then. Give this to the clerk outside. Thank you. The next two years are the hardest of your life. And you have a tiny baby to take care of. But thank God you do. Some days, she's the only thing that gets you through. You pick up some secretarial work here and there, but only enough to keep you under the limit to still receive benefits. You battle depression. Not the, I'm feeling a bit bummed out today kind, but the deep, impossibly dark kind that settles in like a dense storm cloud and never seems to lift. One day, you're at a girlfriend's house, and she's telling you a story. Something about a party she went to with her husband and children, but you can't focus on it at all. All you can think about is how many freaking toys they have. Dolls, cars, stuffed animals, Legos, puzzles, more Legos, action figures, balls, a big wheel. Jessica's toys, meanwhile, can fit in a shoebox. All of them. You know that for sure because that's where you store them. In a shoebox. How is this fair? Why is your friend's life so perfect and yours is such a shambles? You did everything you were supposed to do. You're a smart, capable person with a college degree and a profession. Is there something you're missing? And the nagging voice deep inside that keeps telling you, this is not the person you were supposed to be. Well, there's not enough Tchaikovsky in the world to drown it out. That afternoon when you get home, you take Jessica's toys out of that good old trusty shoebox for her to play with, and you cry for 20 minutes straight. You consider suicide. You truly do. The pain of your mother's loss is something that never leaves you, but you could never put that on your daughter. So, you seek treatment for your depression. It helps. Over time, it seems like the cloud starts to lift. Maybe you're imagining it, but what does it matter if you are? A lift is a lift. You're leaving your therapist's office one day to meet your sister Di for coffee, and you realize something profound. There's an upside to bottoming out, as you so spectacularly have. Freedom. Thanks to your complete and utter failure, you can now strip away the inessential and be who you really are. Finally. All my life, I've done what other people wanted me to do. What mom and dad expected me to do. You're with Di in the cafe her husband bought after moving into the city. And what did all that acquiescing get me? Nothing. I mean... Look where I am. I thought you said our cafe was cute. It is. You know what I mean. I mean, generally. So what are you gonna do? I'm going to stop pretending to be anything other than what I actually am. And what I am is a writer. It's the first time you said it out loud like that. 
and it makes your cheeks flush. Your heart races. You feel exposed, a little embarrassed. You look down, stir your coffee. Here's to my sister, the writer, then. She raises a cup, and you eat it with yours. For the record, I knew it all along. You think again about the one who got away. That boy on the train. Where did he go? Maybe you can find him again now that you're free. The truth is, he's not that hard to find. Because he never really left you. Even through all the high drama in Portugal, he was there. You'd usually spend the hours before work in a cafe, daydreaming and writing in longhand about his burgeoning talent, his bouts of self-doubt, his adventurous spirit. You know he's not husband material, he's a lot younger than you, for starters. And he spends so much time with his friends, they're more like his family. And maybe there just isn't room for anyone else in his life. And then there's the fact that he's a fictional character. This feels like the bigger impediment. He inhabits a fantasy world that doesn't actually exist. You can't get to it by a plane or train or car or skateboard. Talk about geographically inconvenient. Yes, it's true. He lives in a box of notebooks and scrap papers you brought back with you from Portugal. And this guy doesn't even exist to anyone but you. But you've never believed in anything like you believe in him. And with nothing left to lose, you're going to see his story through, or go down trying. One day you give Di your two-line elevator pitch of the story, and she laughs. Thank God. If she hadn't, this newfound I'm-a-writer-hear-me-roar empowerment thing you've got going might have dissolved right in front of you like cotton candy in a mud puddle. You develop a routine. You push Jessica in her carriage from your apartment to your brother-in-law's cafe two miles from your home in the hopes that she'll be crashed out when you get there. Then you write for a few hours at a quiet table upstairs. Then you do it again the next day. Sometimes you pick a different cafe, sometimes a bar. For a chapter involving a key athletic event, you head to a sports bar for inspiration. You keep going. Even while you juggle the rest of your life, caring for your baby, picking up the odd secretarial job, cashing your weekly welfare check at the post office. Ugh, that one's always a soul crusher. The summer of 1995 brings three jolts of much-needed good news. Your divorce from Georgie becomes final. Hasta la vista, baby. You score a coveted spot in the year-long certification program that will allow you to work as a teacher again. And best of all, Thanks to a scholarship grant, you're able to come off public assistance for good. Seven years after dropping into your mind out of nowhere, your boy on the train is ready to be introduced to the world. You've finished your damn book. Let's hold for a bit of applause for that, shall we? No applause? Okay, fine. Plenty of time for that later. The book's done. Now you've got to figure out how to get it out there. Self-confidence has never been your strong suit, but you know that people are going to love this book. If you can get someone to print it, the gatekeepers are your hurdle, not the readers. And you have zero connections. So you pick up a book at the library called The Writers and Artists Yearbook and start reaching out to random literary agencies. You invest in a slick, high-tech-looking plastic folder to help your submissions stand out, and bingo! It catches the eye of an assistant at one agency who fishes it out of the slush pile and calls you. Let's hear it for fancy office supplies. We don't usually handle books in your genre. Oh? Because they never make any money. Oh, I understand. It's the head of the agency. But everybody here loves the book. The humor, the clever illustrations you sent along with it. Wow, thank you. And we want to represent you. 
It's the best news you've gotten in, hmm. No, it's the best news you've gotten ever. You hang up and start dancing around the kitchen table and you don't stop for a long time. Jessica thinks mommy's gone crazy and she likes crazy mommy. The agency starts to send the book out to publishers. Penguin's the first to pass. And then the rejections start to flood in. Two, three, four. Your goal was never to set the world on fire. Five, six, seven. You just want someone, anyone, to print it. Eight, nine, ten. You just want to be able to walk into a bookstore and see your book. That's been your number one daydream for as long as you could daydream 11. What if it doesn't happen? What if no one wants it? Who says 13 is an unlucky number? The 13th publisher you hear back from wants it and buys it. Bloomsbury. It even sounds like a verdant garden of creation. You score a modest advance, not enough to give up teaching and buy an island, but something. While you wait for the book to be published, you work on writing the sequel while tending to Jessica and teaching French at a local school. You feel like you're pregnant with a baby no one can see, and you're very careful about who to tell about it. You don't want to jinx anything. One day, one of your students, a rather scattered girl named Maggie, shows up late to class with no paper to write on. Go to my desk and grab a few sheets from the top drawer. A few minutes later, you've noticed that Maggie hasn't returned to her seat. You look over and see she's still at your desk. She's discovered some pages from your new follow-up novel and she's completely immersed. Maggie, come back to your seat. Are you a writer? You don't know how to respond. Why don't you just say yes? Yes, I'm a writer and I have a book coming out next year. Why is that so hard? It's just a hobby. Now come back and sit down. The day finally comes when your book is published and your dream of walking into a bookstore and seeing it is everything you dreamed. But then you look at the sheer number of books that aren't yours, lining shelf after shelf, all the books in the world. Why should anyone choose your book over all these others? You say a silent prayer to the literary gods. Please let it do well enough that they'll let me do more. Because you have so many ideas. Your storylines and characters, some actually written down, and some just banging around in your head. If this ends up being a one-and-done situation, what are you supposed to do with them all? Do you think the voices in your head will just sit down and shut up? Not a chance. It's gotta do well. Otherwise, you'll just have to get a head transplant because there'll be no living with it. The first day it's published, you walk around the city with tucked under one arm. Two days after the book hits the stores, four-year-old Jessica learns to say the title and often shouts it out unprovoked. Hey, free advertising is free advertising. Three days after the book is published, you get a call from your agent saying that your life's just changed. He tells you the international rights for your book were just sold at auction for the whopping sum of $100,000. You nearly fall off your chair. Soon after, you're on the phone joking with the publisher who bought it. Are you sure there wasn't some mistake? My book's very specific to the culture it's set in. Do you think it'll translate overseas? Well, it better. Or I'm out a hundred grand. You're not sure if you should laugh, so you sort of half laugh. (laughs) Congratulations again, and one more thing. Don't be scared. Thanks. I am. With the windfall from the international rights, you're able to leave teaching behind and make your living as a full-time writer. That was always the dream, even when you dared not to share it with anyone or even admit it to yourself. Anything over and above that is gravy. It's a good thing you like gravy. The book becomes a worldwide phenomenon, 
and almost overnight, you become wealthier than you could ever imagine. The moment you know you really made it happens during your second book tour. As your car approaches the Barnes & Noble where you're set to appear, you see a line of people waiting that goes on for blocks and blocks and blocks. Is there a sale on? You ask the escort from your publisher's office. Nope, they're all here for you. It's official. You're the new Beatles. There's a lot of kids in line, not surprisingly, but also adults without kids. People of all age, shapes, sizes, and colors. But they all have one thing in common. They're clutching a copy of your book. Your newfound fame comes with some downsides, mostly related to privacy. But you manage the best you can. The biggest upside? You get to spend your days doing what you love. The only part of your life that's unsatisfying is your love life. Not just unsatisfying. Non-existent. You survived Portugal. You survived poverty and depression. You made your wildest dream come true. But now... I want to fall in love again. You're having dinner with a girlfriend at the kind of restaurant you used to walk by when you were poor and think, who can pay that much for pasta? What qualities should Mr. Wright have? Let's make a list. I need to be with someone intelligent. Intelligence? Good. I would like him to have his own career. Own career. Makes sense. And kindness is important. Someone with a strong sense of who he is. And integrity. Did I already say integrity? I don't think so. So yes, integrity. Add that to the list. Your friend holds up her wine glass as if to toast to it and then says, forget it, it's never going to happen. The next week, you meet a man who has all of those qualities. And he's a doctor to boot. So there. You marry him in December 2001. In the library of your home, surrounded by your loved ones and your books, which seems fitting. It's lost on no one that your groom looks like a grown-up version of Train Guy, right down to the trademark wire-rimmed glasses. Over the next seven years, you'll have two children together, a son, David, and a daughter, Mackenzie, to go along with your firstborn, Jessica. You will also publish six follow-up novels to that first book. Each will be a monster hit and feature details cribbed from your own life. You'll turn the clinical depression you experienced into a horrifying mob of monsters that steal the joy and life force out of everything they touch, but can be kept at bay with chocolate. Above all, it will be the loss of your mother that resonates most profoundly throughout the epic saga of your orphaned hero, it's there on every page, linking the saddest and the happiest parts of your life together forever. The day on the train when you first thought up your fictional hero was six months before your mother's passing. Your biggest regret in life is that you never told her about him. She would have loved him. You're certain of it, just like the rest of the world. The most gratifying part of all your success has been that it's allowed you to give millions to causes close to your heart, like multiple sclerosis research, the National Council for One Parent Families, and Amnesty International. You've also started your own charity, Lumos, to help institutionalize children around the world. The girl who often got scolded for daydreaming in school is living a life beyond her wildest dreams. But that doesn't mean you'll be able to communicate anything of value to these Harvard people. And, uh, oh yeah, television cameras. There's going to be TV cameras. Just shoot me now, you think. The sun's back out. It's actually a beautiful day. So much for getting struck by lightning. What? Oh, I was making a joke about how I want to get struck by lightning so I don't have to go out there and speak. Oh, <laughs> You stop walking. Another two steps and the people in the crowd will be able to see that you're there. If you turn and run now, they won't. 
There's still time to flee and plead food poisoning or something, alien abduction. But then you remember, for all of your insecurities, for all your shyness and ambivalence about the spotlight, there's one thing you know is true about yourself. One thing you've never doubted, not through poverty, not through Portugal, not through all of it. And it's this, you know how to tell a story. So, one foot in front of the other, you go out there and you tell a story. Your story. Focusing on two themes you are extremely well acquainted with. The upside of failure and the power of imagination. You start off shaky, but you can feel the crowd's affection for you. They're glad it's you. You can tell. You have a gay joke ripped from the headlines coming up. If they laugh at that, you're good to go. Please let them laugh at the gay joke. Delivering a commencement address is a great responsibility. Or so I thought, until I cast my mind back to my own graduation. The commencement speaker that day was the distinguished British philosopher, Baroness Mary Warnock. Reflecting on her speech has helped me enormously in writing this one because it turns out that I can't remember a single word she said. <laughs> this liberating discovery enables me to proceed without any fear that I might inadvertently influence you to abandon promising careers in business, the law, or politics for the giddy delights of becoming a gay wizard. The joke lands, and your entire body relaxes, like a parachute that just opened, caught the air, and stopped your free fall. And miracle of miracles, you actually start to have fun up there. The speech is very well received, and later gets published as a book on its own called Very Good Lives. The proceeds go to your children's charity. In the years since the Harvard speech, it's been reported that you are officially wealthier than the Queen of England. You didn't know that was even possible, and you find it embarrassing. The movies based on your books become the highest grossing film franchise ever, surpassing one of your faves, James Bond. There are theme parks, plural, based on your work, as well as a blockbuster play on Broadway and in the West End that's packing them in as we speak. They're all based on your story about the guy you encountered on the train. The one you later claimed popped into your brain that day fully formed. A young, brave orphan who is a wizard, but doesn't know he's a wizard, until one day he gets whisked off by a train to a wizardry school called Hogwarts. His name is Harry Potter. You are J.K. Rowling. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Imagined Life. If you did, please subscribe right now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Wondery.com, or wherever you're listening. If you're listening on a smartphone, tap or swipe over the cover art of this podcast, where you'll find a link on the episode notes and some offers from our sponsors. Please support our show by supporting them. If you like what you're hearing, we'd love for you to give us a five-star rating and tell your friends to subscribe. Another way to support us is to answer a short survey at wondery.com slash survey. And a quick note about the recreations you've been hearing. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said. Those scenes are dramatizations, but they're based on real historical research. I'm your host, Virginia Madsen. Dennis Hensley wrote this episode. Sound design is by Jeff Schmidt. Additional audio assistance by Sergio Enriquez. Theme music by Breakmaster Cylinder. Our executive producers are Stephanie Jens and Marshall Louie. And it was created by Hernan Lopez for Wondery. For those of you great guessers out there, Let's put your skills to good use. Don't just imagine what it would be like to listen to any book you want on your morning commute. 
make it a reality with an Audible membership. You can win three months of free listening to books like The Diana Chronicles by Tina Brown or Elon Musk, Tesla, SpaceX, and the Quest for a Fantastic Future by Ashley Vance. So, how to win? After each Imagined Life episode, we'll give you a clue about next week's episode. Then, if you head over to wondery.com slash imaginelife to submit your guess, you'll be entered for a chance to win your free three-month membership to Audible. This week's clue is, you were a cover girl before you were a big screen legend. Have an idea? Go to wondery.com slash imaginelife to submit your guess, or find a link in the episode notes.